Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who have logged on to this exciting set of sessions on RAISE, Responsible AI for Social Environment, Empowerment. My name is Ramanan. I'm the Mission Director of Athal Innovation Mission, Niti Ayo. We from Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, the National Institution for Transforming India, Niti Ayo, and Digital India are proud and privileged to host a series of sessions on AI for social empowerment with a scintillating line of speakers, accomplished people who are devoting their time, energy, and attention to the leveraging of technology and emerging technologies for the benefit, not only of the economies of the world, but also for the social good of the world. A topic like AI for social empowerment is especially relevant in a country where we have 1.3 billion people, where we have over 65% of our country under 35 years old, enjoying what is called as a demographic dividend, where we have more than 4,000 towns and small cities, and we have only eight tier one cities. Uh, we have 600,000 villages. Uh, we have 715 districts out of which 115 of them are aspirational districts striving to have better access to health, education, transportation, affordable housing, clean drinking water, sanitation, and so on. So, and also we are living in a country which is having one of the fastest growing economies of the world. It is also being shaped by technology that is changing the very shape of the world, the way you are experiencing the world and the way the world is experiencing you. And because of the convergence of advanced computing, communication, and sensor technologies, Artificial intelligence has become an important aspect in driving future innovation across the world for solutions to problems that we see in and around our communities. And therefore, I am delighted today to be hosting this special, special session on AI for all and the role multiple partnerships and multiple stakeholders are going to play in the involvement of AI for social good. But it is also important to keep in bear that while technology can be leveraged for economic progress of various nations, unless we enable technology to bridge the digital divide, the economic divide, the social divides that we in our country have and many parts of the world have, we will not be able to successfully leverage technology for the benefit of all. And therefore, I am pleased to introduce the first keynote speaker who is going to be talking about this particular subject. Dr. Bhaskar Gorti, the president of Nokia Software and Digital Officer is going to deliver a keynote speech today. Dr. Bhaskar has rich experience in working with Nokia, Oracle, Portal Software. Bhaskarji is responsible for developing Nokia's strong software business at scale and leading the team to build cloud native, multi vendor, multi network software solutions. In addition, Bhaskar also serves as the chief digital officer to accelerate Nokia's business and information technology modernization. Prior to Nokia, Bhaskarji has worked with Oracle as the senior vice president and general manager for nine years. We cannot have a better person to talk about the importance of partnerships and multiple stakeholder involvement in the evolution of AI for all. And I hand it over now to Mr. Bhaskar Ghorti. Uh, thank you, Ramanan, and thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm personally uh, honored and uh, it's a privilege to be invited to, to speak here. So if you allow me, uh, I would uh, like to uh, bring up my slides. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Okay. So first of all, you know, as I said, thank you. And this is a very, very, um, interesting topic, I, artificial intelligence for all, and how do we build partnerships to make AI accessible, uh, to drive innovation. And this is not a new thing. Um, you know, 
artificial intelligence back in 1956, uh, one of the papers that was written and co-authored in Bell Labs of Nokia by Cloud Shannon um, really laid the foundation. Since then, AI has gone through a lot of periods of ups and downs. Um, I would say, you know, in the late 80s, uh, in fact, something that we all use today, uh, Jan Lum uh, from our teams biologically inspired a model for image recognition, which we all use today in our bank check uh, identification and deposits. But through the 90s and um, uh, later, AI went through a dark period because the community lost interest because it actually did not connect to the individual and the human society. Now that has completely changed and AI has become really a key point in us driving things forward. So all through these years, through the ups and downs, we have been working through and our teams have been focused on three sets of tools to really understand and model and make predictions. And there are three areas of research that we primarily focus on today as we bring innovation, engagement, and service to the community. They fall in these three categories. I would say there is a theoretical aspect to it. We are developing methods of characterizing optimal structure, tuning and training machine learning algorithms. Then there is a scientific part of it, is how do we leverage these physical simulations to transfer these models to drive innovation? And all the time, while it, IoT has been talked about for a while, we've been very focused on how to bring IoT to the human community around the world. And then finally, actually what is more interesting and when uh, we all talked about it is this third aspect called deductive. How do we interpret the interactions of humans, machines and things in a shared space? So in our work, we all of us live today in some fashion, whether you call it deep learning or machine learning or artificial intelligence, it is touching all of us today. So, but it is doing it in a different way. So I want to introduce a concept which maybe many of you have read this book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. Kahneman was a Nobel Prize winner, an Israeli psychologist and economist that studied the psychology of judgment and decision making. Among other things, he pointed out that human beings and human errors arise from heuristics and biases. The theory of humans is about two systems of thinking. System one, which is unconscious, which is fast. We make everyday decisions. It's automatic. To give you an example, if you are looking for a friend in a crowd, your mind deliberately focuses on the task. It recalls the characters of the person that you're looking for and you try to locate her. This focuses you and us to help avoid all the potential distractions that you barely notice that is happening around you. If you maintain that focus, you'll find the person in minutes. Whereas if you're distracted, you lose focus. This way of thinking is what we call system one thinking. Now, system two is a very different way of thinking about these things. It's very conscious. It's very deliberate. It is slow. It involves complex decisions. It takes a lot of effort and it's extremely reliable. Now, what does this all have to do with AI? A lot. So I think in the next few minutes, I wanna just share a little bit about what we, believe we all are faced with is a balance between system one and system two thinking. And deep learning has been very useful, you know, computer vision, voice recognition, speech to text. 
But these are the things that we feel now are getting us ready for what is ahead of us. So the future of AI is in building system two machines. Systems that are built with mental models of a situation and transfer this to a real world. We have to focus on the important pieces of information and learn from these. We have to understand the cause and effect and learning by interacting with the world around us. And finally, we have to recognize the biases and errors and take action to improve. Imagine what we can do with all of this. Now, you know, we all know about this gentleman. Um, he's very well known. Um, and what really strikes me about Vishy is how he has mastered in fact, he's one of those rare examples of somebody who's an absolute expert in system one and system two and transitioning between these two. It's a very complex game. An average chess player requires system two thinking, deliberate, take effort and think about it. But Vishy has learned this game so well that he's actually taken system two thinking into system one. And he has been, of course, all of us admire him and aspire uh, about his achievements. He was known as a lightning kid. He has taken this thought process to an extremely different level. He's considered by many as one of the rap greatest rapid chess players of, of the generation. But now I think even he is, could be, with AI and ML in machines like DeepMind, um, which has taught itself how to play chess, I think can beat Vishy. So looking forward to how he competes again and makes this happen. The other example that I wanna to bring to you about, and I was watching this movie, Social Dilemma, which uh, maybe many of you have seen it. It's a documentary that uncovers the dangerous impact of, of social media and search platforms. We have seen how some incredible innovation in social media that is trained to capture our attention is incredible, but also scary. Never have a handful of tech designers had such control over the way billions of us think, act, and live our lives. Little things like a like button that was meant to bring positivity into the world has ended up doing many times the opposite. Reports have indicated that the higher use of social media corresponds to declines in mental health, increase in disinformation, and more participation by extremist groups. I specifically want to raise this in the context of RAISE 2020 with our goal to create AI in India that works for India, we must use system two. The system that monitors our issues and continues to mitigate the risks to our society. We must consciously work to direct our talent, our technology and our capital to better understand and answer these questions. Now, I wanna share a few things that we in Nokia have done over the many years. Recently, a group of elite engineers at Nokia, we competed and won in a challenge put on by the US government to find innovative uses of technology to improve national security. We won this contest, a handful of engineers, half a dozen to eight or so um, from all parts of the world contributed to this. And we call this application the sixth sense. So sixth sense took us beyond level one thinking of detecting crowds, automatically classifying events and identifying people in the crowd without any regard for privacy. So one of the things that system sixth sense applications concept 
was based on data fusion and augmented intelligence. To identify accidents and other threats to human safety while respecting privacy and enabling rapid first response. So here's an example of how we have brought AI and ML to the real world. So the application has many, many features and it looks at functionalities and features like crowd density and anomalies, automated news search, extremely important in terms of privacy, picture and video analytics, local observations, and at the same time, triggering the appropriate actions. So here is just one example of how we can use these technologies like AI and ML to actually bring more human safety while respecting privacy of people. I wanna share another example where we've been working with for quite some time. It's in farming. We all now, many parts of the world, system one thinking, monitors and we assess crop health. We look at images and classify and soil conditions. That's been going on for quite some time. Nothing new about it. We have partnered with Aero Farms and the objective was to look at the entire process from energy use to pest control, to change in crops, to unexpected situations and resulting in agricultural experiments. So we have worked with them to optimize all of these aspects, whether it's energy costs, whether it's impact of pesticides, and then the result has been phenomenal. And I wish we could now scale this around the world is using this technology from Nokia Bell Labs of plant analytics and aero farms, we have built an environmentally responsible farming that can be enabled for local production at scale around the world. An example is aero farm now runs the world's largest indoor vertical farm and yields up to 390 times more produce than a traditional field, all without sunlight, soil, or pesticides, all with less than 95% water consumption. Here is another example of how artificial intelligence, machine learning can actually impact humankind around the world. And the last example I wanna share with you, which we are very, very familiar with uh, in, in Nokia is connecting the unconnected. All of us, this is, you know, it would be great if this conference was happening in person, but we're all in different parts of the world. I'm here in San Jose, California. Many of you are spread around the world. So in fact, connectivity has become a basic need. And in fact, uh, sometimes in Maslow's hierarchy, it may be the first need we have today. So we in Nokia are working around the world, supporting billions of subscribers especially in these times. And we get asked many times, how do you optimize coverage? How do I optimize capacity? Business continuity is no longer now in offices and buildings. Business continuity is in homes, in apartments. So it's everywhere. So we have worked diligently to bring artificial intelligence, machine learning, and tools of automation to really take this especially in these COVID times, to a much higher level of consciousness. And one of the things that really we learn and um, we are striving as Nokia is how can we make an impact in connecting the unconnected and eliminate this economic bias that has happened because of these times. I think connecting the unconnected is not enough. I think we need to really focus on how we can apply different technologies to bring connectivity and bridge the digital divide across the world. Now, 40% of the population is unconnected or underserved. It's not just enough to download videos and watch TikTok. I mean, that's, that's fine. But now healthcare, education, basic day-to-day -day life is now unconnected. So how do we make sure across the world we can work with our customers to bring at least a minimum recommended 
downstream and upstream speeds. Here is another example of how we have used artificial intelligence and machine learning to really bring and touch uh, every person uh, moving forward. So at the end of the day, I think um, what I want to say is these complex problems require complex thinking, but they require simple solutions. Today, artificial intelligence and machine learning is making a big impact on everyday life. The technical development is incredible, but I think the social development still has to catch up. As I said, it's too bad. Most of the most remarkable AI is used to help us which TikTok videos or which news suites to look at. Those are not the problems that RAISE 2020 is about to solve. We are after something bigger for India, something more inclusive. And those bigger challenges in front of us require a new type of partnership that brings me back to the theme of this session of AI and ecosystems and partnerships. It requires a different mindset of partnership between machines and more conscious thought process. We in Nokia are ready to serve India and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bhaskar for uh, scintillating conversation, very stimulating. Uh, thought provoking, thought provoking, and I, I thought also at sometimes quite provocative in being able to make us look at different aspects of what means, uh, what does it mean when we say AI for social good? And you emphasize on a couple of things which I just thought were key takeaways for me: uh, the focus on system one and system two thinking, uh, the tremendous power of AI to do good, uh, the fact that. Uh, you also explained through Sixth Sense application what one could do and what one could achieve. Uh, you mentioned very poignantly about connecting the unconnected. And you said 40% of Asia is unconnected or in the unserved, underserved uh, regions. It was uh, uh, saying of uh, Intel inside, uh, Intel inside everything. And that's been one of the hallmarks of this company. Mr. Jeffrey is Intel's top government affairs representative. He's a key decision maker on policy and trade matters an advisor to the CEO, board, and general counsel on the implications for Intel's business. He leads a global team of over 200 employees that represent Intel's more than 70 sites around the world, shaping the policy environment to advance business strategy and to accelerate growth. Directs a unified strategy on a range of priorities that are critical to Intel, its customers, and the industry, including all trade issues and policy responses to artificial intelligence, 5G, autonomous driving, and other transformative technologies that are shaping the world. He is an industry thought leader with more than 30 years of experience in global trade and policy. Uh, here is a video recorded speech of uh, Mr. Jeffrey because of the time zone difference, and I request them to play this particular video. Good evening, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to uh, be representing Intel Corporation in this Responsible for AI for Social Empowerment Summit of 2020. Um, you know, Intel um, uh, has just come out with a, no, a new purpose, and uh, this purpose is to create world-changing technologies that will enrich the lives of every person on Earth. And I'm excited because this is very well aligned with the RAISE Summit goals. And so I'm just I'm glad to be able to be with you today. You know, um, Intel has been develop, developing and creating a world changing technologies for more than 50 years. You know, in fact, Intel put silicon in Silicon Valley. You know, but today we're taking these same technologies and we're using our reach, our scale, our resources to deliver bold goals. We don't do this alone. We're working with uh, governments, we're working with customers to really try to create um, this impact on our world. Um, you know, with our customers, um, we are making roads safer, we're combating climate change, and we're making healthcare more accessible. You know, our solutions, they really unleash the unlimited potential of data. And this leads to innovation, 
that is enhancing lives all over the world. So if we, if we think about data for a minute, you know, data has really emerged as this transfor transformational force in an era where everyone has devices and everyone is connected. If you think about it, everything, including our homes, our cars, our cities, our hospitals, they all look like a computer, and it's all generated staggering volumes of data. We see this in our retail stores, in our hospitals, in our manufacturing plants, and even in our cars. I think we've also all experienced this each and every day as we live through this pandemic and how dependent we have become on our on, our, on the data that our, our, our computers generate as we work from home, as we study from home. You know, as you think about this new era of data, you know, success really will be measured by how well data-based actionable insights are brought to fully, um, to moments of, of human need. It must be stored and processed faster and more securely than ever before. You know, Intel, um, is your true partner in building these actionable insights really for a better world. We have expanded the boundaries of technology and we make the most amazing experience possible. We are a data company and in order to, to, to create solutions, we, we realize that data must be used and analyzed in massive amounts and this data is generated around the world every minute, every day. And so we at Intel are working to make AI accessible to everyone. You know, driving innovation um, involves, you know, building human capital, young people, Vira, and, and we see this as uh, critical for India. Um, we're so glad to see if this is India's highest priority as a government as part of your digital India agenda. You know, at Intel, we've also raised the bar on ourselves. Um, we've um, a new initiative um, that's called Responsible, Inclusive, Sustainable, and Enabling. We realize that we have to move from not only operating from our, from our head and, and, our, and our technology, our knowledge, but also from our heart. And so we've, um, we've com committed to a more responsible, inclusive, and sustainable world that's really enabled through technology and the, our collective actions. You know, I'd like to just take a minute to, uh, to share a few examples um, of, of how we are applying this, this new initiative. Um, we are partnering with governments. And, and communities um, to really address um, the digital divide and expand access to technology skills that are really needed um, for current and also future jobs. You know, one example is um, Intel. We put forward a program called Intel AI for Youth, and it really um, provides AI curriculum uh, resources um, to over 100,000 high school and vocational students in 10 countries. And it will continue to uh, scale globally. You know, by 2030, we plan um, to par partner with governments in 30 countries, um, and in, which, which would involve 30,000 institutions worldwide. And we're committed to empowering more than 30 million people with AI skills training. You know, when I think of um, the impact of this program, even in India right now, um, we're already seeing uh, tremendous things happening. Um, and this is with the support of the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of IT. You know, the goal is to really build an AI ready generation for India. One of my favorite ex um, impact examples is shown in this picture of, of, of this young girl. Um, she's from a government aided school in India and um, she's created an AI solution, which she called the happy, happiness guru. And really the idea of her solution is to protect the onset of depression among school children. And she's doing this by using computer vision. I find this is fascinating to see how the young people, when they're given access to this technology and they're able to use their own creativity and their own sense of, of wonder and innovation to see what they can produce. Really excited to, to, to let you know that this, this young girl now aspires to, to become an AI ethics uh, lawyer. We at Intel, um, you know, we're really taking um, this agenda, agenda of driving innovation forward. Um, you know, even at this event, um, we're, the Minister of IT is going to be announcing the names of top finalists for responsible for AI for youth. And uh, the youth um, are from government schools and they're undergoing right now extensive mentoring by Intel experts and coaches and helping them to figure out how they can create solutions using AI. Think about it, if one girl can create this magic, 
Uh, I can't even imagine the impact of hundreds of thousands of youth uh, across India, well, what they will be able to do with your support. You know, these are tough times as we go through this uh, pandemic. Um, and I just really want to uh, say a big thank you uh, to you for showing us the hope um, of how young, innovative minds um, can change India and the world. And so uh, let us raise together uh, for this innovative India that we are shaping together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jeffrey, for that wonderful uh, talk. You uh, mentioned about technology that uh, enriches the lives of every person on earth, thereby capturing the essence of this particular uh, theme, AI for social empowerment. You mentioned about unprocessed data is untapped potential and how true that is. Uh, you also mentioned about um, the importance of uh, educating people and Intel has been a great partner to Athal Innovation Mission. I would like to thank Intel for that. Uh, we have over 5,000 tinkering labs across the country with two and a half million students exposed to AI today and leveraging technology like 3D printing, robotics and IoT for learning about AI and how you can use them to solve problems in and around the community. And finally, you also mentioned about uh, the Intel, the responsible, inclusive and sustainable goals that need to be pursued through uh, AI solutions. So uh, wonderful, thank you once again for participating in this. I now have the pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, the panel uh, discussion and I'm sure you're going to have some extraordinary uh, exchanges of information as well as enlightenment through this panel. I'd like to first introduce the moderator of the panel, Mr. Balendu Sharma. Mr. Balendu Sharma is responsible for localization of Microsoft products services and content in 22 major Indian languages, involves reaching out to people and ultimate beneficiary of efforts. He is a recipient of the Atmaram Award at the hands of the then president of India, Sri Pranab Mukherjee, for propagation of technological temperament in the society through the use of information technology. He is the author of four books and has translated a few, written more than a thousand articles on technology, on language technologies, in mainstream vernacular press and has received about a dozen awards. He has been Microsoft most valuable professional 2007 to 2009 and a winner of Google contests on index blogging. Now on to some of the panel panelists. Dr. Neeta Verma, Director General of NIC. Dr. Neeta Verma is spearheading the development of digital platforms for various initiatives of the government of India under the Digital India program. She was instrumental in setting up the technology platform for MyGov, which is a citizen engagement and crowdsourcing platform engaging over one crore of citizens. At NIC, she has led the establishment of one of its kind centers of excellence in blockchain, application security, artificial intelligence, and data analytics. In 2019, she was featured among the top 55 inspiring women around the world who have showcased the prowess of technology in the government sector. Thank you, Dr. Neeta Verma, for joining this panel discussion. We then move on to K.R. Sanjeev, Chief Technology Officer at Wipro Limited. K.R. Sanjeev is the Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Wipro's global IT business. As a CTO, he is responsible for establishing the country, company's technical vision and strategy and also leading various aspects of the company's future technology development. This includes incubation of emerging technologies, creating an ecosystem for innovation in these spaces, IP management, and creating industry and academic alliances. Prior to this role, he was the global head of analytics and information management business unit. He has carried PNL responsibility strategy and operations of this unit globally, reporting to the CEO. He has over 25 years of experience in IT, including consulting application and technology development spanning multiple industry segments. Thank you, Dr. Sanjeev, for joining us in this session. Mr. Arvind Gupta, a close personal friend of mine and former CEO, MyGov. Arvind has over 25 years of experience in leadership, policy, and entrepreneurial roles, both in Silicon Valley and in India. He is an Eisenhower Fellow of Innovation and an active member of industry forums, NASCOM, TIE, 
and founding member of iSpirit. He is a member of, I, w, of, of the WEF Digital Futures Council and the OECD Initiative on Global Value Chains. He is on the board of IIT VHU Alumni Association, Pan IIT Alumni Association. He also mentors many startups and is a guest speaker at Global B Schools and CXO events. His expertise includes digital transformation, open innovation, platform governance, technology policy, new media, citizen engagement, startups, data analytics, civic technology, and government technology. He's also the former CEO of MyGov, a citizen-centric platform which empowers people to connect with the government and contributes towards good governance. Thank you, uh, Arbinji, for joining this particular panel. Mr. Rudramuni, Vice President and Indian R&D Head, Dell Technologies and Co-Chairman, CII Center for Digital Transformation. Mr. Rudramani is working as a head of Delhi's R&D in Bangalore, positioning the engineering capability for strategic success of Dell's enterprise business while directly managing all the operations of Bangalore Center. Through teams in Bangalore and Austin and leveraging engineering relationships with OS partners, enabling enterprise operating systems and hypervisors on Dell servers, he provides a point of view on un upcoming building blocks of cloud technologies and virtual data center, design strategies to build innovative and efficient engineering organizations, and to create and nurture a culture of innovation across Dell in India. Dell has been a tremendous partner to Niti Aayog and Athal Innovation Mission in all its initiatives. And I welcome Mr. Rudramani for joining this panel. And finally, we have Professor M. Balakrishnan, Vice Chancellor, Satya Bharati Institute of Technology and Professor of CSC Department, IIT Delhi. Professor Balakrishnan has worked as a scientist in CARE, IIT Delhi from 1977 to 1985, where he was involved in designing and implementing real-time DSP systems. For the last 32 years, he's involved in teaching and research in the areas of digital system design, electronic design automation, and embedded systems. He has published nearly 110 conference and journal papers. Further, he has held visiting positions in universities in Canada, USA, and Germany. SSTEC, a laboratory and research group founded by him, along with Professor PBM Rao, Mechanical Engineering, is involved in developing a number of assistive devices targeted towards mobility and education of the visually impaired. As you can see, we have a wonderful panel, very distinguished, uh, very accomplished. And I now hand it over to Mr. Balindu Sharma for conducting the proceedings of the panel. Thank you so much, Mr. R. Ramanan. And good, good afternoon, everybody. I welcome all of you to this panel discussion on partnerships for making AI accessible and driving innovation. The stage for the discussion has already been beautifully set during the keynote speeches from Mr. Bhaskar Gorthi and Mr. Jeffrey. They talked about the use of AI in agriculture, skilling, last mile connectivity, innovation, untapped potential of unused data, as well as the enormous work that has been done by Nokia and Intel in the field of AI and bringing its fruits to the society. It is a matter of great pride and privilege for me to moderate this panel discussion in the presence of such great luminaries in their respective fields. We have leaders representing many important sectors, which are actually the pillars of India's AI ecosystem and are playing a pivotal role in its development, deployment, delivery, research, innovation, infrastructure, and skilling. We have distinguished panelists from the government, the IT industry, the Confederation of Indian Industry, and the IT education sector. There is no limit to the power that artificial intelligence holds, and hence, a responsible AI is at the center of our deliberations. This global conference is extremely important as it may contribute significantly in shaping a worldwide agenda and a vision for socially responsible AI. Accessibility of AI, innovation, and partnership are the three focus areas for us. They all bring considerable amount of opportunities as well as significant number of challenges. Access to AI is a subject which is more focused on the people at large, the society, at the same time, the innovator as well as the developer, etc. 
the government and the large enterprises have a role to enable access to ai and this can come from different ways the support that they can provide that can come in different ways and we are going to talk about that at the same time from the user's perspective constraints to access to ai can come from various quarters such as awareness skilling economic conditions infrastructure data issues various divides that exist and so on and so forth if we look from the innovators angle then lack of skilled resources fund limitations lack of infrastructure and sometimes regulations they may, they might affect uh, the development of ai related projects or initiatives maybe partnerships could be a way around meeting some of these challenges we hope to come up with a fruitful discussion around the topic today let me also introduce to you the speakers once again briefly they are dr neeta verma director general of national informatics center nic mr k r sanjeev senior vice president and chief technology officer for wipro's global it business mr rudramuni b co chair cia center for digital transformation and he is also the vice president and head of r&d at dell mr arvind gupta former ceo mygov and professor m balakrishnan vice chancellor satya bharati institute of technology and he is also associated with the iit so my first question will be to dr neeta verma dr verma you are spearheading a comprehensive technology ecosystem having very complex digital infrastructure components and processes at a nationwide scale which includes the government cloud megraj the delivery mechanism for government services and the vast information network in the form of thousands of government websites cloud being the power behind the power of ai nic is also on top of india's ai ecosystem arogya setu which was deployed at a humongous scale within a very short span of time has already played a pivotal role in india's fight against against covid-19 may i please request you to share your experiences and insights regarding the work that nic has done and opportunities for public private partnership to take india's bright ai story forward in his inaugural address the honorable prime minister had talked about making technology accessible to people with disability and across languages i would also request you to please share how nic is exploring these areas dr neeta verma good morning good afternoon thank you balindu and thank you ramanand ji in fact it's an honor and privilege to be part of this panel on this race 2020 you know at national informatics center we partner with government from central government to state governments to district administration as well as with industry in building it solutions provisioning robust secure, secure and resilient it infrastructure for government for whether it is their own internal functioning with the management of programs or delivery of services to citizens to take these partnerships further we had set up these coes why these coes are different from the other coes because these coes center of excellence which we have set up in ai data analytics or blockchain they are primarily focusing on application of these technologies in government whether it is for governance or whether it is delivery of citizen services with underlying theme of inclusion which prime minister very much um, emphasized during his uh, inaugural address and when we are talking of inclusion it is inclusion from all aspects with people having challenges of language literacy or even various kinds of disabilities or divyangs as we fondly call them and uh, so if i talk of uh, coe first and then the cloud how are we really helping so this coe which we had set up in artificial intelligence in 2019 it basically works on three dimensions first is it explores use of ai in governance and citizen services and then it basically does capacity building and hand holding of nic teams which are pan india we have 800 offices across india and even the remotest district in of the country has a presence nic has a presence there 
along with the government officials whom we have to basically handhold and tell that how this ai can help in their um, to day, day to day work or delivering a particular service and through them then deployment of models which have been done in this ui is at nic headquarters into the existing e government applications i often focus is that in the existing systems which are rich in data which are already delivering citizen services how do we induce small small components of ai and make those experiences better for our citizens or better for the government officials so that they can do their work with much more efficiency and effectiveness thirdly we have also augmented our cloud further with additional um, different kind of capacities to provide ai ready infrastructure to government departments so whether it is nic teams or any other government department trying to uh, do some kind of um, uh, innovation or some poc in using ai where they have to build some models or do some model training for them we on cloud we provide this ai ready infrastructure for these departments so if i just tell you some, some um, examples of the important work which we have done in the short span of one and a half year january 2019 we had brought this ai ceo in this thing so they have brought an application which is i'm i'm trying to i'm only mentioning applications which are already in uh, implementation now or already in use like they use image analytics for swachh bharat mission urban to help applicants put right photos as per the scheme specifications because the scheme specifications are expect citizens to put photos with certain things in frame with certain specifications and often if these pictures are wrong the your installation your uh, inst uh, installments get delayed and then your uh, your payments and all will get delayed so to help them and citizens will often not know and we had a lot of experience seeing that they they put all kind of pictures with face covered with door covered of the toilet and then they all were getting rejected so this at the first place when they are trying to upload the picture it makes sure that you put the right and correct picture which is geo tagged with right elements in this place so it's been very helpful particularly for swachh bharat uh, mission uh, program similarly we have done for meghalaya which is ready to be launched soon which is life certificate for pensioner verification this has been particularly done during the time of covid because it is very difficult particularly and not advisable for the elderly people to go to the banks and you know register their lifeness and to continue their pensions and all so this is basically powered through um, liveliness detection and the facial recognition through which they'll be able to register their um, liveliness and continue their pensions similarly we had done about an year and a half ago a project called virtual courts because you know in our country courts have a huge pendency to so save these courts from handling trivial matters lot of those simple kind of cases we have tried to brought them into virtual courts so as a result need for a litigant or a lawyer to go to the court has been completely eliminated in fact during the covid times even the honorable judges were not expected to go to the courts they also handled and and thousands and thousands of cases of these have been sorted out using these virtual courts uh, this has been further extended because you know earlier like if you look at uh, chalan cases on the road traffic of offense cases it was there was a um, traffic cop who used to do issue chalans now you have these cameras so we've also augmented this facility with the um, with the number plate recognition facility through which even the cameras are automatically issuing notices and then judges are virtually kind of because all those uh, compoundable uh, offense you have to go to the court i mean i don't know if anyone has an experience where to pay 500 you have to spend one full day take a date and do so all that has been eliminated and the good thing is during covid initially it was working in delhi it has been during covid time it has been extended to seven states in india so that way i feel it's been uh, and the idea is now because all these uh, cases you don't need courts and judges uh, presence there so lot many more important cases where people are suffering in prisons and all can be attended and their precious time is saved in handling this similarly what we have done in this motor we have kind of uh, this text analytics or cognitive search case they have done where motor accident claim petitions where the model has been developed through by submitting a petition it can search through and kind of do this uh, cognitive search and tell wh what is the likely compensation and what are the citations which have been referred in different cases while 
settling uh, these kinds of cases so you get many a times if you know what is the idea you may decide to settle it off the court and maybe the save your time is saved and court's time is saved at the same time uh, another project which we have recently done you know in lot of government applications you have to put your ids identification any kind of benefit any system uh, you you will either put your ration card you will put your aadhar card or you will put it i mean uh, or you will put your um, uh, some kind of a passport for that matter so in so we have built a system through which when you submit your id using text analytics image recognition as well as ocr based deep learning it can automatically read from that card can pre fill your information or can verify the information because we've sometimes seen odd cases where you put an identity as one but the card you submit is entirely different which could be intentional or which could be otherwise so it's uh, it's going to and and for the government officials if the huge applications opening each of these id card and then comparing becomes extremely difficult and lot of work is to be put in to simplify their work this way system automatically will tell in case there is any difference in what person has put in in the form and what is there in his particular id and and we have and and as i said for us bringing things on scale is very important so we have built up this model where these some 10 to 15 cards are already model has been trained but the facility is there where anyone can come to this uh, platform and put in his uh, sample records and train model for the cards because in india different places will have even birth certificate will have 10 different variants in different languages but so this generic platform will now empower any application to bring on board and bring this facility of uh, auto auto reading or auto verification kind of another focus which we have lot is in conversational ai because we is very strongly believe because today is the right time to make government services completely paperless cashless and uh, contactless so that the need for people to go to government uh, offices can be completely eliminated and therefore we need to increase the reach of government to these citizens in a big way and where these chatbots and voice bots perhaps can do better work than what uh, government officials will do sitting and this in the sense because person may ask question four times five times chatbot doesn't get irritated he will answer the same question to you 10 times also that way and uh, we have uh, and we and in this also we've taken the approach of building a chatbot framework using which you can quickly empower your power your chatbots so our 12 chatbots are already in production in this short time so these are the kind of activities we have done and once we do this activity our major thing is now look for partnership with various state governments district administrations and see how can they use these models which helps us strengthening our model and it also helps us democratizing these things at a larger scale so that different entities of government who sometimes you get very enthusiastic district collectors who are looking for doing some small things and if you provide this kind of a help in terms of infrastructure in terms of uh, these models they can really do a lot of innovation on the ground and which is what uh, i think the whole uh, the sense is all about now if i come to our how do i use as you know we had launched our cloud in 2014 and today we have around 10000 government applications which spans from simple websites to large applications like my gov swachh bharat mission uh, even um, fertilizer subsidy pm kisan you heard of or even complete public finance management system of the government all is being powered from this the advantage of cloud has happened that today my officer sitting in the remotest district of india can leverage the power of cloud and do a lot of innovation and service uh, onto this and this has really tremendously helped under digital india program you will, lot of programs have been actually made live uh, completely digital from concept to commission in a matter of few weeks or a month which earlier used to take years you know you have to write rfp you have to size you have to take big approvals all that has been really uh, significantly reduced i mean time has actually come to weeks and months which was used to be years so what we have done to because ai needs for anyone i mean whether it is a small organization or a big government organization needs a huge compute capacity needs access to those frameworks to be able to do so so that to make this thing easy for everyone we augmented our existing cloud which is makeraj with gpu kind of a infrastructure for ai modeling 
this platform we is also equipped with open source ai frameworks and models that are customized for gpu hardware such as tensorflow mxnet etc and it also supports open source ai model direct transfer learning from uh, net let me just tell you this was introduced i think about a year ago a bit we when we, we had very conservative only two petaflop supercomputing facility was added for basically vision and natural language processing applications and this was allocated to these departments on a time slot basis 24 cross 7 and over a period of time of one year we have been able to support 25 different projects of ai with this very very uh, modest investment and now encouraged by the way people are showing interest and their enthusiasm we are now adding 10 more 10 petaflops flops more into this infrastructure so that we could uh, really make the uh, cater to the requirements of all this so essentially what i'm saying is that from the partnership perspective we already partner with uh, with the government uh, with industry and uh, we have been always exploring that how do we really enable these startups also particularly i feel that the 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 aspect where we will really be able to help them we will definitely need some support from government departments in provisioning them data for training their models because there's a lot of data which is there in many it system which has been generated but of course it has to be in the concept of government departments but that is another thing which uh, where huge partnerships can take place where uh, by enabling uh, particularly these uh, young startups to be able to train their models and roll them out thank you thank you dr verma for the vivid description that you have given regarding the work that nic has done in the field of artificial intelligence and especially how nic has been able to give it a human touch you talked about a lot of things and uh, they are all very important but couple of insights that i have gained from your uh, speeches that we are right now witnessing an all together new government culture which is quite exciting which is quite modern because we are talking about taking artificial intelligence to offices we are talking about conversational ai paperless offices chatbots democratization of ai etc that is really very exciting and that uh, gives a good indication as to the future is going to be very bright uh, you talked about the centers of excellence which have been established by nic and which are engaged in capacity building and at the same time they are innovating also and some of the good uh, applications that have come from these centers for example the swachh bharat related uh, work that has been done at the same time the pension verification part it was really very painful to see that a uh, uh, elderly person used to go to the bank to to prove that he is alive if we have been able to eliminate that kind of things i think that is a great social service as well and that is what makes artificial intelligence very relevant with the agenda of this uh, particular conference so thank you so much for those insights uh, uh, dr verma after uh, dr verma i would move to mr k r sanjeev mr sanjeev you have been responsible for shaping wipro's future technology development vision and you have also been working to create an ecosystem for innovations in various emerging technologies what kind of possibilities do you foresee for ai at major indian organizations in the service sector like wipro how prepared are we to adopt ai at scale so that it becomes an advantage for us so that is one question another question i have for you is since you come from wipro which is also known for being a socially responsible organization how do you look at artificial intelligence from the lens of social responsibility mr sanjeev uh, thank you balandu uh, am i audible yes thank you uh, and good afternoon to everyone so bilandu i'll answer i'll mix my answer to address both the aspects of your questions because i think the fundamental issues when you speak of scale and ai at scale uh, the fundamental issues are same whether you're speaking of large corporations or whether you're speaking of you know big sectors within a, within the society uh, so when we look at when we look at the ai applications that are currently being rolled out you know across our customers globally um i would say we are in what what i would call as phase 2 of ai rollouts phase 1 was all the uh, you know rpas and uh, 
primarily the the you know rule based kind of applications and currently we see a lot of deployments where we are using machine learning we are using deep learning to address many point solutions you know like some of many of the examples which were given you know uh, the ability to identify faces objects the ability to extract some information from some documents or the ability to direct a call or a mail to the right expert or the right department right those are the kind of ai solutions and they're making a huge impact right they're creating great experiences whether it's for citizens or whether it's from a, from a, a organization perspective but most of them are impacting what i would call as in process matrices right within the process you know it's, it's going faster it's more accurate less number of people to do it not too many of them are impacting let's say a pnl statement of a large corporation right individually or even if you aggregate them even from a society perspective in terms of creating a nation of the you know competing with the international nations or creating an industry sector which is really the top of uh, um, role model for the entire world i think that's what i would say would be phase 3 of deployments and that's where scale becomes a very big uh, component when you move into phase 3 and phase 3 would be when you build applications that impact millions right uh, whether it's from a functionality or diversity or the complexity or the 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 the, the investments required i think it's a completely different ball game right it's quite different from building some good uh, uh, some good innovative um, uh, point solutions kind of thing and i would share two three things which i think is very essential to address uh, as we uh, as we move into this phase 3 see the first one and none of these are going to be you know something eureka or something great it's something which we all understand but i think the real fact is i don't think anybody or 95% of the people have not even implemented it it's it's not easy easier said than done kind of scenario so the first aspect i would say is around what what i would call around standardization the right standardization within the aspect of a domain an industry a sector a nation or whatever it is uh, but but the the fact is you cannot have hundreds of flowers booming without a larger plan for a forest kind of scenario right um, it's not that it, there is only one way of doing things that won't work but you definitely need to have a playbook it can't be wild west where every every group every department every department within an, uh, within the government or every state is doing their own work in their own way and building their own stacks and technologies and tools and processes and uh, compliances which are very uh, uh, which are not synchronized so there is a need to standardize standardize how people will uh, use uh, how ai will be used what kind of platforms what kind of tools what is the security considerations what are the ethical considerations who will take the decisions on what uh, right the whole funding so standardization is the first aspect and it's required whether it's a corporation whether it's a service server serv- serv- you, you know si like wipro or whether it's a large global bank or whether it's a large governmental department the second point which i would bring about is the need for platforms right if you need scale if you need if you need to make an impact at a much higher level then the sum of the parts has to at least be uh, you know equal to the sum of you know the whole sum has to be equal to the sum of the parts it can't be it ideally should be a multiplier now you can't create that unless there is a common platform that is enabling everybody who's creating solutions on that uh, uh, right so if you look at it the productivity of the people involved you have a limited capacity an organization has a limited capacity a nation has a limited capacity how do you make that same limited capacity deliver twice of what it is delivering from a productivity but you can't do it unless you have platforms that do a lot of many common things you know within an enterprise for example if there are 10 groups building ai app- applications 50% of the work is not related to building models or anything to do with it it is got to do with uh, you know connecting to the back end systems how the security is implemented how license modeling is all these should be off the shell of the package of the platform so that's one aspect of uh, platform the second is how do you how do you bring uh, maximize the common denominator across all the applications so you look at it yeah uh, let's take uh, uh, from a from a uh, from a sector perspective uh, and we have seen some examples of platform a payment platform that india has implemented look at the amount of solutions and uh, applications that have come over it whether it's a uh, digital wallets or payment solutions or fraud solutions all enabled because there is a platform that was created and aadhar is a great example of a platform that can that can be leveraged for so many 
applications. But you look in other industries, you know, healthcare, you look in agriculture. We had an agriculture bill which is passed, which is expected to bring a lot of uh, a revolution, right? And AI would be a big player. But what is the platform that will enable so many startups or corporations to build, build uh, on top of the platform? You know, today, uh, as an example, even, even if you have to go locally, I think it was mentioned by uh, uh, Dr. Neeta that, uh, you know, uh, people are interacting through speech, right? But local language, enabling speech in the uh, local Indian languages, there's a complete lack of repository. I mean, it's impossible to build a real global or a real high uh, volume uh, mega applications using the current repositories, right? So is there a platform that will, uh, that will be available that will enable irrespective of what kind of NLP programs or applications you are building on top of it? So the need for a platform to increase productivity, to enable newer applications to be easily onboarded, to enable that there is a cross-pollination, right cross-usage, uh, uh, platforms are extremely required. And we have seen it in the, in the development world. I mean, 10 years back, if I asked anybody to build some uh, language translator, it requires a PhD from IIC or IIT or somewhere to, to build it. That's the only way it could have been built. Right now, if you look at a lot of uh, platforms or libraries available, right services available you know gpt3 or some of these newer ones it's possible for even an average programmer to build some kind of translators right that's exactly what has to be enabled at a central level from a platform perspective the third thing i would say is uh, you know the the data i mean we all know that ai is all dependent on data but i'm not speaking of getting data you know you have to get sources of data you have to get uh, but even after having the data I think there's a huge problem in making it available to the AI developers. It's a traditional problem when we had structured data in the 2000, you know, we had all these MDM solutions and ETL solutions and all those to, to enable data to be leveraged or monetized, you know, from a business perspective, big data came in and we had said, today we have multi-dimensional, multi-layered, you know, multi-pattern data. And how do you make it available to everybody in a, in a complement, in a combinatorial fashion? I'll give a simple example. One department annotates a certain data for its own use. They annotate it. But if you look at it from a top-down perspective, if they had annotated it differently, right, maybe 10 other projects could have used it. That's what I'm saying. How do you manage data? You know, how do you make it? How do you define certain ontologies or whatever it is? Uh, 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 how do you define certain vocabularies around data that, that will enable easier applications, stronger applications, bigger applications to come? I'll uh, make a final point on uh, the ways of working, right? And I think that is, to me, that is a big, big change when you move into what I call as level three, high, uh, high volume, high functionality, how, uh, high complexity applications. See, no organization, you know, we speak a lot about building skills. Yes, we will build skills. We will import skills. But at the end of the day, no organization, uh, I would say even no country would be capable of, will be self-sufficient to develop all these applications at scale, at speed, at complexity uh, that is required. You need to extend beyond your organizational boundaries, new ways of work. As an example, using crowd to build a data models. There are millions of AI developers across the world. There are a lot of gig economies. There are platforms. We internally use a platform called Topcoder, which has got a million developers, right? Can you define processes by which you can obfuscate data, by which you can create sandboxes, so that things like building complex models can be done by experts who are available on the tap? You should be able to accelerate your development process by a factor of three times, and the complexity and the quality by at least four times. I think that is the requirement. That is possible today, but it requires a way in a way of working which is very different from what we are doing today. I mean, it's our waterfalls and two eyes and you know we need to really rethink that when we are building these uh, big uh, complex application and the last point is uh, on the ways of work and is uh, something which is my personal opinion and uh, i may get pushbacks on this i think we see a lot of you know what i call as pilots or pocs right which are being executed in the space of ai they were very good when it was 2.0 when we were uh, you know we were ourselves learning I think, I think today we have reached a stage where I would say that 90% of them are a waste of time, 
right? You don't hear of pilots and POCs in, let's say, some enterprise applications or CRM applications. So we have reached a stage where I think we take these big problems, define the big blueprint for solving that problem, and we take it in iterations. But forget the investments and the time we are losing in doing a pilot, doing a POC, trying to see. I mean, pilots and POCs are by definition designed to succeed. They don't address the real problem of adoption, cultural change, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we should straight away get into defining the large problems, uh, the funding mechanisms for these problems, the governance for these large problems, right? And then straight away get into, you know, how what is the best structure by which we can execute these. So those are some of the points. Obviously, there are a lot of points, but I thought from a scale perspective, uh, some of the basic requirements which need to be in, otherwise we'll end up continuing to get a lot of point solutions and a lot of, uh, you know, they'll all be, uh, very exciting and very good, uh, you know, things to talk about, whether it's a company or an industry sector. But I think uh, um, the real transformation, something that will affect millions of people or create billions of dollars, I think that requires a lot of change uh, in the way we are approaching or implementing AI. Back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanjeev. Actually, you uh, presented very insightful as well as interesting observations. For example, you talked about phase one of AI adoption, then phase two. Right now, we are in phase two, and we are looking at phase three. And during phase three, the kind of demand which is going to come up and the supply that we will have to provide, that is going to be humongous. Right now, probably we are, I don't know whether we are prepared for that or not. So you rightly indicated towards that. And you also came out with the solutions. Your uh, reference of UPI and Aadhaar was, was very important here because we have all seen that how as a platform, UPI has enabled so many uh, other applications. And at the same time, Aadhaar has been used by not only uh, within the government, but also externally in the private sector at such a mass scale, such a big scale. So definitely what you have talked about is uh, that the platform which is required uh, that might actually revolutionize the way we are working in artificial intelligence or maybe innovation. And uh, uh, the platform has to be, uh, it has to be common. It has to be available to everyone, whoever is interested. At the same time, you also talked about making big data available to innovators. And that is again, a very, very insightful point and very important one. There are also certain questions that come up with uh, when we talk about data, for example, uh, the security of the data or the privacy of the data, as well as the responsibility that it brings along whenever it is shared with external people. So those kind of things we will have to look into also. And, and this also brings me to the responsibility that the innovator has. If the innovator is responsible towards the development of socially responsible AI, I think many problems can be solved. Uh, for example, regarding the sharing of data, etc. And here I would like to mention a, a, a policy that we follow at Microsoft, because that might be a good example here of social responsibility. And we follow uh, certain principles. For example, the first, first principle is fairness of the AI uh, project that you are developing, reliability and safety, privacy and security, that is third, inclusiveness, whether it brings everyone together or not, then transparency of what you do, how you are going to use the data, and then ultimately accountability. So these are some of the issues that I think we will have to solve, uh, but, but the suggestions that you have given, the solutions that you have suggested, they are very pertinent and very, very insightful. Thank you so much for your insights, Mr. Sanjeev. And now uh, I move to Mr. Rudramuni. Uh, Mr. Rudramuni, devices can be a prominent vehicle to take uh, the power of AI to masses. And you come from uh, Wipro, so I think uh, I can talk about that. Uh, sorry, you, you come from Dell, so I can talk about that because you are dealing with devices. So, however, the world is still divided between the haves and have-nots. And technology adoption and innovation at the grassroots level faces some real hurdles as PC penetration is still an issue in the country. As Mr. Bhaskar Gorthi mentioned and Mr. R. Ramanan also mentioned, that a large part of Asian population is still unconnected. Now, this impacts access to technology, even though we have been able to achieve considerable success in bringing connectivity to the masses, be it the national fiber optic network, the public telecom providers, or large commercial initiatives taken by some private players. Unless a device reaches every household, 
we will find it difficult to create a kind of constructive revolution that we want to bring into the country. What do you see could be the solution to this problem from CII as well as Dell's perspective? So that is one question. My another question to you, you is, AI technologies seem to be more software oriented and lots of innovation is happening in software. But Dell being a hardware, hardware company, what does this mean to you? How is Dell contributing to the emerging AI? Mr. Rudramuni. Hey, uh, thank you, Mr. Balindu. Uh, it is an honor to participate in this uh, panel discussion. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, interesting uh, topics that you are raising. And uh, um, I'm happy to share the perspectives from CII as well as from uh, Dell side. Uh, I'm associated with uh, both the organizations for a while now. So, before I answer the specific two areas that you mentioned, uh, let me share a point of view. Um, so let's look forward and uh, look at the world we need to pay, we need to lay a foundation for an era of a human and a machine partnership. For decades, machines have performed activities that uh, we should not do or we do not want to do. Right? This includes, uh, say, a variety of uh, dangerous situations um, where uh, dangerous chemicals could be involved or a set of repetitive tasks have to be done again and again, and uh, we don't want to do it. Or actually the tasks that do not require the so-called uh, uh, problem solving skills. Right? So the machine to, uh, I mean, a human machine partnership has evolved uh, to address some of these things. Moving forward, the volume and the velocity of uh, data growth will completely overwhelm our ability to harness it or to mine it and get the value out of it, right? So the machines are powered by the rapidly maturing field of AI, and we are hearing uh, uh, experts uh, on that topic already. So these machines actually inform us, act on our, on our behalf and uh, empower us to achieve things that we may not be able to achieve at all. This new ability to process a huge amount of data on a scale greater than uh, ever that we have done in the past, uh, they provide the rich insights uh, from this kind of a data. That is, also, that is going to be a key to success in this uh, new era. The potential of human machine partnership is going to be immense, a lot more actually in the, in the coming future. Absolutely, it is true that we have partnered with machines for centuries. But thanks to the recent and uh, emerging software applications, these applications call them AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, machine learning, variety of them. Right? Rapid developments across the science, technology, engineering, and communications have brought about what is being called the fourth industrial revolution. So these variety of emerging software applications, along with the variety of uh, innovations, rapid developments that are happening is, is bringing a very different uh, revolution that is, uh, that's happening all around us. We are entering this new era full of fresh possibilities for the mankind. By offloading more to mach machines, we will be able to focus on uh, what a human uh, should do best and is capable of doing best. Right. So with that uh, uh, point of view, let, let me come to the specific question that you mentioned, which is about the, the penetration, uh, technology penetration, call it as a PC penetration or a mobile penetration, all that. It is a problem and uh, uh, fully aligned with you. And, uh, will it impact the adoption of AI at scale? I, I, I would actually push that uh, question to a little bit more by saying that the lack of adoption of AI or a lack of adoption of it in general, digital technologies is actually already having a negative impact. It is actually slowing the economic growth. So uh, what are the solutions? What is that uh, we should be addressing? Right? And let me focus on the solutions part, right? So I'll share uh, uh, two viewpoints, one from uh, what CII is doing and another is from a Dell side. So CII has established this uh, Center for Digital Transformation. Okay, this is almost uh, two years back. The center's vision is uh, very straightforward, to be a center 
of uh, international repute that enables the continuous betterment of organizations through digital transformation. That's the reason it's called Center for Digital Transformation. The purpose is to help Indian industry become globally competitive. Right. But Dell Technologies is proud to be the founding partner of the center uh, over the last two years, and we will continue to be there. So the center has a very specific uh, uh, three areas in uh, how uh, the technology adoption can happen. Um, surely a lot more to do with the uh, micro, small, and uh, uh, medium enterprises in the country across the verticals, across the industries. So these three specific uh, focus areas of the center are uh, one is skill development, and the second one is uh, assessment and enablement for digital transformation. The third one is scale to reach the MSME, micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSME across the country, right? So the, the, the technology adoption and the penetration that you articulated as, as a question is, is actually addressed by this center. And uh, obviously one center is uh, really uh, nowhere sufficient for the size of the country that we are in, right? So, but the CII center is actually making a progress over the last couple of years in that context. It is a multi-year journey. The journey has already started. Huge number of training sessions, webinars are being rolled out at a very, very affordable cost. The center also has rolled out this uh, a tool or a methodology called Dexel. It is actually meant for assessment of where are you on this digital transformation journey and subsequently trigger the, uh, the adoption much faster, or accelerate the journey itself this is also the, the intent of that methodology. The scalability itself is a huge challenge um, across the variety of industries, variety of uh, languages, variety of uh, uh, diversities that we have across the country. So the scalability is actually solved or met by using the regional offices of CII and the vast network of its members, right? So within the MSME itself, uh, anywhere between now, uh, I, I would say, uh, uh, 1.2 or 1.3 crores are the members of it. And uh, that network can be very well used to, to address the scale to a certain extent. Right? So that's how CII Center for Digital Transformation is addressing the technology penetration, especially amongst the MSN. Okay. Now, what is Dell doing? Dell is actually solving through the technology innovation. Right? We recognize the necessity to get closer to the source where the data is generated, right? So that is so-called the edge computing. Um, edge computing is evolving very, very rapidly. And the intent is to reduce the data transfer between the edge and the so-called cloud. It is possible to hold frequently access the data at the edge than accessing the cloud every time. The edge computing obviously requires set of devices of a very, very different capability and capacity. Uh, so the device needs to be a lot more robust. If you can imagine uh, the environment under these uh, edge conditions. So it needs to be a lot more robust to deal with temperature, dust, humidity, and so on. Right? The edge computing should always be available. And uh, obviously, if something goes wrong with those devices, uh, you want to be able to remotely access and manage those edge devices. So the innovation is actually happening on a variety of subsystems like I said, uh, these uh, to cater to the needs of the edge computing. So with, uh, with respect to the AI adoption and the technology adoption, uh, CII has started solving the scalability issue via the center for digital transformation. And Dell is actually solving more through innovation in edge computing. Obviously we are uh, investing in variety of other technologies also, but edge computing is one of the critical areas for us. So that, that's how uh, uh, the CII and Dell are addressing the, the penetration part from the technology. Now, the second area that you asked is also an interesting one where uh, you're saying uh, AI is software centric. And uh, true, uh, in, in a generic sense, uh, uh, AI is a lot more innovation is happening on the software context. Right? And Dell being a hardware, how do we contribute to the emerging AI? So, um, how does AI succeed, right? For AI to succeed, the most important is the so-called, uh, the data, data as a fuel for AI to succeed, right? 
So the data comes from, like you said, IoT devices, social media, internet, you know, all kinds of uh, mission critical applications. So the massive amounts of data are actually driving the AI. Now, while the fuel is the data, the engine for the AI is the supercharged computing system. Right? And this is where uh, Dell Technologies has been playing the role. Right? The hardware computing is, is the area of interest for Dell um, in, the, in, a, in a context of AI. The system should solve three specific areas again. One is performance in terms of computational capability as well as the data storage capacity. Number two, processing power at the data source, wherever the data is generated, right? And the third one is uh, bandwidth and the cost, uh, cost associated with the data transfer itself, right? All these three are actually solved through uh, a great innovation and a, a variety of uh, subsystems uh, come together uh, to solve the larger problem of uh, the computing uh, requirements, be it a uh, regular uh, microprocessors that uh, that are uh, that are working on uh, servers to storage to laptop everywhere, right? Those are all the regular microprocessors. Graphic processor processing unit GPUs, processors that consume the low power, and surely the memory subsystems for faster throughput, flash storage devices. These are all the subsystems where variety of innovation is happening and uh, uh, Dell Technologies puts all these subsystems together to meet the expectations of AI as a software application. It was uh, really exciting to hear Dr. Neeta uh, when she said that uh, NIC has already deployed GPU-based system, um, right? And uh, it was also uh, great to hear from uh, Sanjeev that the scalable platforms are required to make the data available to the masses and a, a new emerging applications can be developed over all these scalable platforms. So all these, either you call it as a, uh, the data center oriented uh, computing systems or the scalable platforms, they're all uh, heterogeneous in nature, right? Heterogeneous computing is uh, evolving to cater to the computational needs. Storage related innovation is happening in flash devices, memory, in the computing engine is evolving via non-volatile memory as well as persistent memory. Innovation in a network subsystem is addressed through faster network uh, adapters as well as uh, the 5G, when it, uh, when it gets uh, deployed a lot more, it will solve in a larger way also, right? So therefore, uh, uh, Dell Technologies being in a IT infrastructure business, we are constantly investing to innovate computing systems to cater to the needs of the AI, and the AI software would succeed with the supercharged uh, computing engine. That's that's how uh, uh, we have been positioning our investment, and that's how we participate in the emerging AI. So those are my perspective and our viewpoints. Um, uh, thanks to the Ministry, Niti Aayog, Digital India, and uh, surely a CII uh, for the opportunity. Um, Balendu, uh, over, over to you again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rudramani. Uh, you brought into discussion a lot of new ideas and thoughts. For example, you talked about digital transformation, which is very important, not only from the enterprise uh, standpoint, but also from the standpoint of the country itself. And you talked about the scale at which CII is trying to help enterprises as well as small uh, uh, organizations to carry out digital transformation. That is very, very good to hear. Uh, from you, because that is the need of the R. At the same time, you also talked about the challenges that India's diversity brings and how you are trying to work around those challenges that, that also creates a lot of hope for a good future because we will be able to digitally transform if our small scale industries, if the smaller enterprises, if the smaller level businesses Collectively, we will be moving towards a direction where we can ensure that we get a consistent growth. So that is very important. You also talked about our ability to process data. And that is quite interesting because you talked about the velocity and amount of the data, which is going to challenge our capabilities of processing the data. And here, 
the devices also enter, the hardware also enters. It, it becomes very re relevant here. Fuel is data, but the engine is supercharged computing. So we are very, I mean, we are agreeable to you, what you say. And uh, you talked about edge devices also. Now the entire world is coming to terms with edge devices and there are certain reasons behind that. There are several different factors which are now driving AI processing to the edge device. For example, privacy, security, cost, latency, and bandwidth issues. They are all relevant there. And you talked about that beautifully. Maybe uh, the, the uh, speakers who are going to speak uh, after you, they might also talk about that because Mr. Arvind Gupta is also there and he's also uh, linked with some of these kind of things. For example, he, he likes to talk about uh, open AI and uh, you know uh, some other things like availability of cheaper data, et cetera. So that also relates uh, us there. So thank you so much for all the insights, uh, Mr. Rudramani. Uh, they are all very, very important topics that you have raised. Thank you so much. And now I come to Mr. Arvind Gupta, the former CEO of MyGov. Mr. Gupta, you have played a pivotal role in shaping some of the most ambitious technology initiatives in the country. You also bring to the table very powerful thought pattern that looks at AI from a very important angle as a tool for equality and inclusion. As costs on technology, its development, deployment and delivery has gone down due to various factors and the concept of open innovation is gaining momentum. Do you think India is better placed today to take advantage of the emerging landscape? Another question that I have from you is, one of the opportunities that are being discussed today regarding propelling India's growth in AI is to leverage our vast startup ecosystem. Startups have already come out with some innovative solutions and services where AI plays a major role. However, today we aspire to be a world leader in AI. Considering that, considering that, do you think our startups are prepared to play a bigger and maybe a global role towards deployment, development, and provisioning of AI-driven systems? Another aspect is our startup ecosystem, which is often highly competitive and commerce-driven. Is it game for accessible and responsible AI? Mr. Arvind Gupta. Uh, thank you, uh, Balindu, um, and uh, all the speakers in, uh, ahead of me. Um, you know, uh, when you hear um, uh, luminaries like uh, Bhaskar and Ramanan and uh, Dr. Verma uh, and, and everybody else, uh, including my friend Sanjeev and, uh, uh, and the gentleman from Dell, I think um, very little remains uh, for you to add uh, valuable contribution. But what what I want to do is I want to take a very different perspective. I I you know, um, straddle between academics, research, uh, policy making, and entrepreneurship. And um, the the question that you have asked, uh, Balindu, is very very relevant and very close to my heart. Um, and let me start by commenting: over the last uh, uh, one hour uh, thirty minutes that we've been in session, uh, about sixteen thousand two hundred people have used the internet for the first time in India, and at a cost that is unimaginable anywhere in the world. Uh, which is less than $2. Uh, we have the cheapest uh, data cost in the world today uh, as, as, at less than 10 cents of GB a month and uh, totally revolutionized uh, our whole access and affordability um, ecosystem. Two, uh, the, the 16,000 plus who have accessed the internet for the very first time in the last one and a half hours have perhaps uh, uh, are not English speaking uh, 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 consumers. They are uh, using a uh, voice, they're using vernacular, their local languages, and uh, that's a very new set of users um, spread all over India. And, uh, and for them, they are digital migrants to, to this whole digital experience. And the, but, but they are equally important when you come to AI, because they are the ones who probably can be served the best uh, using new technologies, AI, and, and going forward, they may not realize the benefits themselves, but it's a job of the community, the ecosystem, the public platforms to ensure that the goods uh, and, and the benefits of technology are reaching them. So, uh, you know, the session talked about uh, AI for all, and uh, this is again something that uh, it's very, very uh, important to us for to un understand from the Indian context. You asked the question, are we well-placed? 
I, I would go to the extent of saying no country is better placed than India uh, to really talk about and gain um, the competitive edge globally uh, in this world of AI. We have the highest diverse set of uh, data. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Dr. Verma uh, has uh, uh, not not really. Uh, I, I'm saying it on her behalf. Uh, you know, NIC perhaps is the biggest data billionaires uh, of the world. Uh, we, as a government, which basically says our public data is so enriching, and I will walk you through a process uh, uh, that will explain to you how innovation is happening, uh, which is really societal in nature, and how alliances can be built around it to ensure that we get. Um, the, and deliver the potential of AI that we have uh, so always desired. Um, uh, while I was at MyGov, uh, along with, of course, our, our, our great partners, NIC, we, we decided that, you know, we used to get uh, over 10,000 voice comments every day, giving feedback. Uh, and MyGov, for those of you who don't know, is a crowd platform. It, it generates ideas from everywhere in India. On a given day, if I get you know, 5,000 emails or written comments on, on, on the website or on the portal, on the platform, we get twice of that on voice. We also had a voice enablement because that was really showing inclusion in it. People were more comfortable picking, picking up a phone and giving their comments. Now, that's a great data set. It, it represents all different languages and all different kinds of comments. We needed, uh, you know, uh, we thought of a solution. Can we use this AI, non-personalized data now, uh, to create a voice-based AI system? And can, can companies across the world help us? We opened it up as a hackathon. And, and that is where I come to the startups. The number one, two, and three companies finishing in that were startups from India. And one of them was a college uh, entry. They were in their final year, thanks to efforts from the Atal Innovation Mission kind of programs, the culture and mindset of this uh, final year engineering students from, uh, from West Bengal was to solve it. And they finished amongst uh, you know, thousands of entries, they finished in the top three. Now, what does it show? That, you know, of course, uh, as Sanjeev mentioned, uh, we need uh, you know, a, a complete ecosystem of open data um, which is, uh, which is in, in operating in a way of um, what I call trusted data commons, where you put data in, but you also take data out. And of course, it has to be guided by these principles of ethics, transparency, security, and uh, which, which everybody has to sign up before you can actually use this trusted commons. And this trusted commons will not only apply to India. This trusted commons will apply to the rest of the world. And that's where your second part comes into play is India can solve first for India, but that presents an opportunity to solve for the rest of the 6 billion. Uh, and um, in India, AI is, a, is really solving for society first because our problems uh, of are so many and they are so, I mean, Dr. Verma talked about agriculture to, you know, to senior citizens, to everybody else. And we've seen the major success as you both Sanjeev and you mentioned about with, with the, with, you know, data coming from UPI to, to you know, the PSB loans to Aadhaar um, and, and the DBT engine, the direct benefits transfer engine, the entitlements engine that we have. Now, what this does is it gives India the, the edge that we have such diversity of data bottom up rather than top down that can be applied to any um, any use case any circumstance anywhere in the world and that presents india an edge which i i feel um, uh, nobody else has and the second edge india has so of course being a data superpower we become you know the data uh, uh, rich country before we really become economically rich really um, the second point is that we have the trust and the trust that India brings along as from a geopolitical perspective is perhaps the highest because uh, what we cannot ignore going forward is howsoever good AI, uh, it may come from a, from a non-trusted um, epicenter, um, the world will not adopt it. India brings along with it the trust um, and, the, the, and, and along with India, the, 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 the startups that come from India present that trust. And the third is of course skills. Um, yourself, including 
I mean, we have uh, we have expertise uh, within India which understands languages, uh, understands uh, uh, you know voice, understands the complexity uh, of uh, of ecosystems, and we produce more engineers than the rest of the world combined. So I, I think I mean the skills that we have are 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 so tremendous that um, you know this this three things uh, will give India and Indian uh, startups. Uh, the uh, the the advantage to really uh, sell to the world, and I I don't see any obstacles in the same. Um, the last thing uh, uh, that I do want to talk about is this whole approach of public platforms. So India has seen tremendous tremendous growth in uh, in uh, and and uh, economic uh, value addition in opening innovation and the India stack, the whole UPI is a great example of that. Today we have credit uh, flow-based lending because the data exhaust that we are getting from UPI is tremendous. 1.8 billion transactions in September. Um, you know, uh, they're small data points, but uh, small transactions, but huge data points. And this, this is why uh, I think we are we have the potential to completely, completely transform. And um, I, it's worthwhile to mention here that India is imagining its data to be used in a manner which is which is not just protectionism but also for innovation so our you know the architecture for data usage is called data data empowerment and protection architecture it's it empowers and as well as you need to protect privacy and personal data so it is it is interesting um, place that india stands right now and i think um, given the prowess that we have uh, in technology and adoption of technology uh, we will do very very well uh, the, a few points on uh, which I think the group uh, and the panel has discussed, but I do want to bring it again to the table. I think, um, you know, as I said, if you're working in this alliance uh, system, whether nationally or internationally, you need to have certain principles also of ethics, of transparency, of uh, unbiased data, of, um, of uh, you know, of trust being built into this responsible AI that will go along with this data sets that it, it, it can present to the world. And I think uh, that will have a lot more application um, and, and, and applicability. Uh, I know we are short of time, so I'll mention two things and, uh, and leave there. Um, how transformational uh, data has been is that, uh, you know, Aragya Setu, which was, uh, which was developed in a record time, and also had a record uh, outreach in the, of about 160 million uh, people in less than 100 days, um, is, is producing, uh, using AI uh, as helping us identify clusters before, uh, before the clusters uh, themselves know that they, this, this could be containment areas. Now, all this are, are you know, examples of speed and scale. Um, are we done yet? No, I mean, legal uh, processing, um, entitlements, um, news, uh, education, as you, as somebody talked about the NEP program, it has a full uh, section on ed tech in India. And uh, the new education policy, for those who don't uh, know NEP, has a full section on personalized learning and ed tech. So I think it's the beginning of the AI revolution cycle. India has the opportunity to leapfrog. We have the right policies, the right trust, the right leadership, and the right skills uh, for both solving for India and then selling to the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gupta. I think you uh, took the conversation to a very relatable but very interesting direction because we started with the edge computing during our conversation right now. I mean, before, before you, we were talking to Mr. Rudramani and he was talking about edge computing and you, brought the conversation to another dimension by talking about the edge that India has. That India has an edge and definitely if there is uh, one country which is better placed to take advantage of artificial intelligence revolution across the world, I think India is at the top of uh, top in the list of the, those countries. So very valid point you have highlighted, including the facts that you have, you have highlighted. For example, you talked about the cheap data, frugal cost of data. At the same time, connectivity that is getting very cheap in India. So definitely, uh, this is bringing up a lot of new opportunities. When we talk about languages, and you, you very aptly talked about languages, that nowadays, people who are coming to the platform, 
who are getting connected to the internet they are entirely a new chunk of users we never imagined that they will be here on this platform so early but because of these changes which are taking place in the country because of the availability of of these services communication model being successful the fiber optic network getting successful the data connectivity which is becoming omnipresent i think that is becoming possible now today and this is also resulting in some very powerful stories across the country i was reading one report recently that uh, in the year 2021 75% of the people who will be coming to internet they will come from local language ecosystem and and the thoughts that you have shared they they very much relate with that another data point is that out of every 10 people in maybe a couple of years nine will be using a mobile phone in indian language so that is a vast opportunities that we have at hand but whether we are live to that opportunity whether we are thinking in terms of tapping that or not that is very important point to consider for all of us india is a country where there are more than 22 languages 22 constitutionally recognized languages are there but at the same time we are a country where i think 1500 languages are there so this is a diverse country and right now the technology revolution that is taking place in the country and because of which india is almost a super, super power in this field at least in some areas in technology uh i think we must imagine the scale that we can reach if we connect people using different languages in india with this technology revolution so i think that the scale will be unimaginable so amazing amazing possibilities are there opportunities are there and maybe the startup ecosystem which is uh, very youthful which is full of ideas and which is very friendly to technology might address this opportunity as well as this challenge of india you also talked about uh, some other advantages that india has one was that india is a data superpower we create a lot of data in fact so much that it is now being felt that it might be difficult to process that much data secondly the trust that india brings and thirdly you talked about the skills that our people have i remember that india is one of the top countries who are producing graduates in stem subjects so very valid points you have made and very uh, you have raised a lot of hope for us that we can take advantage of artificial intelligence to take our country forward in different dimensions thank you so much uh, mr gupta for sharing all the insights they are very very important and uh, and very crucial in fact to consider uh may i now now invite mr balakrishnan mr balakrishnan from iit uh mr balakrishnan apart from being a professor you are an innovator as well and it's really inspiring to see that you have been involved in developing a number of assistive devices i have a few questions uh, for you first is to what extent do you think ai can play a role in making lives better for people with disability today we see that ai enabled devices and software have already started replacing the aids such as the braille keyboard the stick the crutches as well as support like the guide dogs some of these assistive devices are also getting better as well do you see a technology revolution happening in this space which might finally take us closer to realize our dream of breaking barriers for these divyangjans or it is the other way round what have your experiences been around this that is one question and second question is that since you come from iit which is the premier technology skilling institution in the country and you have been producing skilled ai experts i have a couple of other questions as well from it organizations we hear that there is dearth of skilled skilled students in ai while on the other hand many students say there are not enough ai related jobs in the country if we want to achieve our goal of becoming a leading ai superpower in the world we need both what is your experience 
and understanding in this regard we also hear that a large number of skilled students go abroad to work in multinational companies so is this situation sustainable if we have very ambitious goals in this regard mr balakrishnan thank you thank you for the meeting and others organization niti ayog to give me this opportunity to participate so let me just take a first question so i have been working in the space of uh, mobility and education of the visually impaired for now almost 15 years and developed some solutions so clearly you know from a visually impaired point of view availability of cameras embedded devices very high compute power packed into very small area consuming very low power these are all you know things which are really helping in terms of creating devices that can actually help actually make include them in the society because after all what they are missing is the sense of seeing and if they can see but the problem essentially has been these uh, devices have been coming into the market now so they are still not a huge commercial success but uh, many experimental devices are coming which are also backed up by ai so things like object detection and recognition are now very well understood and a lot of solutions are coming which are actually can detect but the key challenge and that's where the ai fits in is so if you really look at it when we see a scene we see a scene which actually has so much of bandwidth so the image is so rich but it has to be conveyed in a manner either through audio or through tactile and both these are extremely low bandwidth sensors you know sensing that you can do so the audio is sort of you know very slow the information that is contained in one picture or one image is so much so it but it's normally when we are doing it whether let's say when we are mobile when we are searching for something when we are traveling we are not look interested in everything around us we are only interested in something that we are at least at this point in time interested in how do we actually figure that out compress the information images that are coming in so that i can convey the relevant information to the user because of my interface being very slow in terms of audio or alerts or whatever it is so this is still a huge challenge and if we can actually bridge this challenge we can actually give them a mobility which is very close to the mobility that we have because of all if i can have the cameras which are so cheap today to be able to do that so this is of course a global problem but when we come to india clearly there are two major other problems one is of affordability and another is of unstructured environment you know when dr arvind gupta was talking just before me he mentioned the very low cost of data at 10 cents per gb or whatever he mentioned but what i am reminded of was one of the persons who works in my house he had two children both of them attending online classes in the last few months and his daily charge for data was 90 rupees per day to attend online classes four to five hours of online classes so when we talk about affordability we are in a case of extreme affordability you know its affordability here does not actually mean for a very large section of our population and this is something that we have been looking at so when we want to reduce the cost we cannot afford just to reduce the cost by 1/3 or 1/4 or we have to reduce the cost by 1/50th 1/30th one you know that's the type of affordability that this country needs and that in in assistive technology it is even more complex because lot of solutions globally are available which are very expensive small number of disabled rich communities they can afford to subsidize because there is a society which subsidizes the cost cost of these devices unstructured environment is something that you know anything that you take for granted something like uh, let's say we work in mobility for example look at our footpaths footpaths are very difficult to walk for a very well sighted person and if you look from a blind person if he wants independent mobility and if they need to walk on our footpath or uh, let's say take a public bus they have to climb a public bus i do not know how many of in this panel would actually be comfortable in taking a public bus in a place like delhi or mumbai okay so now for a blind person to actually take a public bus is a huge challenge and that's like affordability because he cannot afford to own a vehicle and so on so we have tremendous challenges in terms of unstructured environments and all these essentially gives a huge opportunity for innovation and local solution so what it actually protects is in one hand what it does is we would have to evolve our own own, own solutions the solutions that are actually being evolved in western countries many of them will be just inapplicable language people are talked about 
hand painted sign boards multiple languages you know this is perhaps one of the few panel discussions for last two hours we have been just using english because even if you today listen to a news channel they mix languages so you know that's also very unique to this country you know we keep on speaking in english and then few sentences in hindi or you know some other language local language whichever is present all of these pose very unique challenges in terms of and ai and local solutions are very important let me go to the second problem there i would say that other uh, speakers have presented a very rosy picture of we being at the forefront and we being in a position i am a little bit more skeptical there the problem is we need to be innovative if we want to break this the challenge in ai is so if you look at top global conferences and look at the contribution of research papers from india is extremely low for the size of our population we cannot be happy that we published a few papers because our challenges are large our population is large we have you know as every speaker has pointed out we have huge data huge number of challenges so our research community is small our it industry is very large fortunately over the period of time whenever this uh, you know and this it industry would like to get a huge number of well trained people as what you have pointed out in ai and in all the modern areas whether it is security or ai and so on and so forth so this research community whether it is academics or you know industrial research is so small that to be able to train such a large number of people it is just not possible and we are losing large number of our talent so i had a mentor who used to always used to say this you know one professor indresan who was a big mentor for me some of you may know him is one of the iconic figures in the in the it uh, system he used to say a country which actually imports mercedes but exports those who can build mercedes is in some trouble and you know it is so true that you know what you import and what you export the type of talent we are ending up exporting is actually should be a matter of huge concern because we need to train a large number of our engineers so the number is not a problem today quality is the problem we don't need more engineers actually the, we don't need any more engineering colleges for the next 10 15 years definitely but issue is what is the training level what are the faculty who are teaching those so the growth of it industry also created one problem because the it industry was relatively better paid we we also lost talent to the it industry in terms of people who come for higher education and in terms of research so already our funnel was small and this funnel is we have a huge competition from students for higher education who are going abroad initially it was only at the research level because indians could not go abroad at the undergraduate level and today you see a huge number of migration that is actually happening even at the undergraduate level you may have been listening to this news that many of our top students who are in the je advanced where the result came only day for yesterday they are all migrating out even after for their undergraduate education abroad so retaining talent and expanding talent is extremely important and one of the things i am propose here is unfortunately we do not have any star teacher programs research is actually still fashionable in our institutions research is growing i would say it should grow much faster especially in this high technology areas fast developing areas but we should also have programs by which we encourage people and pay them pay them like ipl stars you know pay them like what uh, cricketers are getting paid if somebody can go ahead and use we have so many nice online platforms but where is an incentive for a very good teacher to teach 1000 students or 2000 students in modern techniques in ai because our models of compensation is still related to a monthly job and a salary for a teacher so i think models need to come people need to actually being able to attract talent into teaching to be able to scale up teaching and we feel that this lack of models is actually keeping training of specialized people because there is there is in for a researcher the incentive is to do research and they focus on research and they don't want to do mass scale teaching the models have to come which actually helps us to do that so these things can actually so we have a potential i completely agree with many of the speakers that the urge to innovate is very high in our youngsters that's a very positive thing but i am not still sure that we have the ecosystem to be able to convert those innovations into businesses the translational funding so i have you know whatever successes i have i have struggled with those translational fundings even been in a place like iit 
the type of funding that is required to translate an innovation or a prototype into a product is still a big challenge. So this we need to solve as a country and people, we have to look at it. Second thing is to be able to do high quality teaching for a large number of people. We have to put in models to do that. If we are able to do this, I think we have a very, very bright future because we have the youngsters, we have the potential, but we are not translating them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Balakrishnan, uh, for bringing to the fore a lot of problems. Uh, in fact, there are some practical problems and we are all aware of these. In fact, I would say that these are big challenges rather than problems because we, we might be able to address these problems. And you talked about uh, the challenges in terms of, uh, you know, creating a sort of revolution in the country as far as artificial intelligence is concerned and training on skilling our students uh, in artificial intelligence is concerned. And uh, you talked about the training level of trainers. So that is that is very important point, sir. Because if the trainers are themselves not of that quality, then the end result will not be uh, matching our expectations. So that is true. Retaining the talent inside India as well as uh, within an organization that has traditionally been a challenge, a, another challenge, and uh, we have to find a solution to that. Maybe through, uh, I think, some concerted effect, efforts are to be uh, made uh, at the policy level or at individual levels. So that is another challenge that we are facing here. Expanding talent, and you also talked about how to encourage the teachers, how to encourage the talented trainers, because uh, the funding is a problem and then the remuneration might be a problem. So unless and until we actually honor the talent that they ha have uh, financially, as well as in some other ways, we recognize their talent, we incentivize them. So without doing that, uh, I think the challenges uh, that we have might be difficult to tackle. But it is very important that we take care of uh, these challenges because without handling these, these problems, we will not be able to pragmatically move forward uh, to the level, to the scale that we want to cover. So thank you so much, uh, your insights regarding accessibility also that uh, artificial intelligence is definitely making a impact on accessible technology, but still there are also certain challenges uh, presently uh, that we are facing. So you actually brought uh, to the table a very, uh, I think I would say candid uh, dimension to this entire conversation and that was very much required. Thank you so much for uh, bringing that uh, to the table and uh, in fact, opening our eyes. Thank you so much. Now we are already over time, but we have a couple of things to be uh, still, uh, you know, uh, taken care of. So can we uh, extend the session? That is the question that, that I would like to ask uh, from the organizers. So I think we can take, I have got a message that we can take some time, maybe uh, seven or eight minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, although it has, uh, I mean, we are over time, but still we can take some time because uh, I have got a message regarding that. So now I would invite uh, Mr. Ramanan to take this conversation forward. Uh, Mr. Ramanan. Um, thank you, Mr. Balindu. And uh, first of all, I want to thank all the speakers and all the um, panelists for a very, very exciting set of uh, exchange of ideas. Uh, thank you, Bhaskarji, for bringing out uh, the tremendous good that, that artificial intelligence can, can bring by bridging uh, system two and system one thinking, unconscious versus the conscious, logical, reasonable thinking. And you, you brought it out very beautifully. Thank you, Jeffrey, uh, for bringing out that how tech can enrich and should enrich every life on the planet. And you also brought out the very important fact that unprocessed data is untapped potential in being able to build responsible, inclusive, sustainable, and enabling artificial intelligence uh, for the good of all. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, uh, Verma, for bringing out the various government initiatives, the centers of excellence uh, in driving inclusive AI uh, for the Divyangjan, as you 
also mentioned and the various initiatives that are already in place and are which are scaling up uh, thank you mr sanjeev for bringing out the importance of scalable platforms uh, ai platforms uh, extending beyond organizational boundaries uh, i think you brought out that point uh, wonderfully uh, to the benefit of all thank you rudramani ji for uh, bringing uh, very cl very clearly how heterogeneous uh, systems and technologies can play an instrumental role in driving the new ai solutions and innovations uh, arvind ji you shared about how uh, india is the perfect place uh, for being able to build solutions that are relevant to ai with the volume of data the rich data that is available the diversity of data that is available as well as with the tremendous growth of startups in the country more than 55000 startups that are uh, up and coming in our country um, and professor balakrishnan you uh, very beautifully brought out uh, the retain talent as well as to build talent uh, you said very poignantly that you know uh, we should not just be importing mercedes uh, we should be ensuring that the people who can build mercedes are being uh, are cultivated in our country you talked about new models of innovation required in teaching and also uh, the translation of research to innovation uh, and the funding and thereby uh, emphasizing the partnerships that need to be developed between the public private sector uh, all in all a wonderful session i turn it over to balindu ji to um, share a few words and and of course uh, i want to thank balindu ji for uh, guiding this session superbly uh, and bringing out different points of view from each of the speakers i thought that was very good uh, you set the framework for everyone uh, in the session to be able to talk about it uh, and and to be able to focus on new areas that the other speakers had not uh, uh, mentioned earlier so with that i turn it back to you uh, for your final comments and and any other thing that you would like to do to wrap up the session thank you so much uh, mr ramanan actually i have to uh, do a little demo and i will try to share my screen i will not take much time but let me conduct the demo i hope you can see my screen now yes yeah so i will not without making much ado actually i'll come directly to the demo part of it because we don't have much time and we all know that there are different kind of uh, disabilities in the world in fact there are around 1 billion people more than 1 billion people who are affected by this or that disability and that forms 15% of the world population uh, and that is I, i think we can understand the kind of enormity which is there uh, related with this this kind of uh, uh, challenge that we have across the world there are six major segments uh, in disability uh, vision hearing neurodiversity cognitive mobility and speech and i would like to demonstrate some of the technology uh, innovations that have been done to take care of uh, the problems which are which are uh, being faced by people who are affected by these disabilities so first of all i'll come to visual disability and this is one mobile application from microsoft the name is seeing ai now the seeing ai works uh, just as virtual eyes for the blind it describes everything around the person it identifies objects and people including their emotions it can read out documents such as a restaurant's menu or a billboard but it is not all imagine if i am a blind person and i am a sales representative i am giving a sales pitch to certain people and uh, they appear to be interested also but how will i be sure whether they are really interested or not so well i can just take out my iphone and i start seeing ai and by just do just doing that i'll be able to know that let me show you how when i bring it out and when i point my iphone camera towards those people this is what happens the seeing ai tells me i see two faces 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised 20 year old woman looking happy so now i know whether the the sales pitch is working or not although i am a person with visual disability so this is the power that ai this is the power that technology brings to that person who is affected by some some disability now when i come I see. to maybe when i come to my office desk once again and before that if i take a taxi and i get off the taxi and i want to make the payment to the taxi driver and you you remember that i am a visually disabled person 
how will I, I know whether the note that I'm handing over, the bill that I'm handing over is right? I can just take out the app once again and look what it does. It tells me the denomination of the note. 200 rupees. 50 rupees. So this is the power of AI. I reached to my office and there- Product processing. Something. There is a handwritten uh, note which I have received uh, from my boss. How will I read that? It is handwritten because uh, we have generally seen that AI is able to read uh, uh, typed text. But what about the handwritten text? Let me show you. Product processing. possible to read it like this. The same application, seeing AI can read it. Handwriting, preview, processing, date. Artificial intelligence can truly empower a person with disability. I go to a mall and I have ordered uh, for a product. How do I know whether the person, the salesperson has handed me over the right product or not? Again, I can take this out and see what happens. I just point my camera towards the barcode and this is what happens. The CEI tells me the information. Product processing. Health Viva Apple Cider Vinegar 100% Natural, 0.5 L unflavored. So this is how CEI becomes my virtual eyes. Now, when I come back to my office and I might not be a completely a, a blind person, I might be a person with low vision or maybe I might be a person with color blindness. How can technology help me? Especially how can artificial intelligence help me? So I'll show you uh, practically here. So I open my Microsoft Word document here and let's see what happens. So this is uh, my Microsoft Word document. Well, and do. Please share the latest report by this evening. Yade na kal sham baat hui thi. Take care, boss. What I have done is that I have just opened magnifier tool inside Windows and that takes care of the problem. It will read it out to me. It will also magnify the size of the, the text which is uh, there in front of me. Let me come to another disability that is hearing disability. I'm a person with hearing disability and I'm attending a meeting on Microsoft Teams. Now there are certain situations, for example, there are many people speaking and I'm not able to focus on the actual speaker who is also presenting at the same time. So what can I do in this situation? Let me show you what I can do. I can actually pin the speaker and he's now visible to me all the time. Let me show you how do I do that. I just go to the picture of the speaker. I right click there and then I will be able to pin that person and I will be constantly looking at person at that person and the problem is uh, taken care of by Microsoft Teams. Let's see how that happens. I pin it and the person is now there. Now in another situation, there might also be an interpreter. And I want two people to be there constantly. At the same time, I also want to focus on the presentation which is being made. So again, I can pin that other person also. And now you can see that there are two people, one is speaker and the other person is interpreting uh, using the sign language. And I'm able to consume all kinds of content here. Now another situation comes, I'm a person with neurodiversity, for example, who finds it difficult to focus on so many videos of attendees. So can I make it look better? Yes, I can do that by using the together mode inside Microsoft Teams. And this is the together mode. Now it appears that everybody is sitting inside an auditorium. So there is no stress of looking at so many uh, different videos at the same time. I feel that I belong to this, to this uh, place and uh, nobody is disturbing anyone uh, else also. People are focusing on what is being said. If you want to see it in a bigger picture, let's see at the bigger picture. It happens like that. Now, again, I'm a person with hearing disability. And we all know that after our meetings, we generally share the videos of the meeting. So everyone else will be able to look at the video, but what will I do? Because I'm a person- But now when I turn on live captions, you can actually see who is speaking. 
This is especially helpful when someone is presenting and you can't see the person talking. So I can. But now when I turn on live caps, switch on captions, live captions, and these are not just captions, but I'm also able to see the person's name who's speaking right now. So I can identify who is speaking as well as I can read the text here. Now, another possibility is uh, what will happen after the meeting ends? If I- But now when I turn on like- And that is transcript of the meeting, while everyone else will be able to see the video and they will be able to consume the detail of the meeting, I will be able to do something else, which is almost equally useful. Let's see what happens here. So I click on transcript uh, option here. And when the meeting ends, this particular link is presented to me. I click on the link and the entire transcription of the meeting is presented to me. I can read it. So other people will be seeing the video. They will be watching the video, but I'll be reading the entire transcript here. Another use case, uh, let me present before you. I'm a presenter, for example, and I'm presenting using PowerPoint. For example, this is one presentation that I have created. And while everybody is able to hear me, but the people who are in my audience, some of them are people with hearing disability. They cannot hear me. In that case, what can I do? I can just go to PowerPoint. In PowerPoint, I can go to slideshow and I, I can activate this always use subtitles here. Now, now imagine another situation even among the audience, even among the people with hearing disability who are there, they might not be English speaking people. They might be Hindi speaking people or Bangla speaking people, Tamil, Telugu or Kannada speaking people. But I'm an English speaking person. How will I connect with my audience if that is that the barrier is there? Can artificial intelligence help me there? Yes, it can definitely help me there. And let me show you how. When I speak automatically, what I speak gets transcribed. And after that, it gets translated into another language of my choice. Let's see that in action. So I have opened PowerPoint here and I start presenting here and let's see what happens. We are going to talk about socially responsible artificial intelligence. I'm proud to attend this conference today. So as we were talking about how to break the barriers, here is one example of how to break the barriers. Let me come to another disability and that is cognitive disability. People who find it difficult to understand, people who find it difficult to express, people who find it difficult to learn, how can artificial intelligence address their problems or their requirements? So I'll, I'll take you to OneNote, which is one application inside your Windows. It is part of Windows. You can download it also. And it is also part of Office 365. And here we go. I go to OneNote. I have some text over here. I just need to go to View. And here I have Immersive Reader. I click on Immersive Reader and let's see what happens. And, and look at me like a person who is either dyslexic or maybe affected by autism, etc. And I find it very difficult to understand what is written. Even though I can read it, I can't make sense of the, the meaning of that, that particular word. And that is a very common problem with people with dyslexia. Let's see how it, uh, artificial intelligence handles that problem. So I click here and let's see what happens. Now this entire desktop experience has been completely uh, transformed. You can see that there is a black screen in the background and the text has become larger. Now I, I'll be able to better read it. But still, if I'm not able to read it, I can take advantage of this button here, which is a play button. I click here and then the system will read it out to me. Let's see that in action. Raise 2020 is a global conference to highlight the importance. Okay. So having said that, even after that, if I have one challenge, I'm still unable to understand as to what highlight means. I don't know what global means. I don't know what artificial means. Even after hearing this, so how will AI come to my rescue? I just need to activate picture dictionary inside OneNote. And now I can just click on any character and you guessed it right. The kind of dictionary will be available here. The meanings will be available here. 
but in an entirely different way, entirely different form. Let's see how it happens. So I go and click on global. Now I can understand that what does global mean? I go and click on highlight. Oh yes, I understand what highlight means. I go to responsible. What is responsible? This is responsible. What is artificial? Okay, this is artificial. What is intelligence? Oh yes, this is intelligence. What is distance? These are distances. And what is a language? So this is language. So this is how artificial intelligence is going to help a person with cognitive disabilities. A couple of more things I would like to show you, uh, although we are very much over time, but one or two things. I'm also learning to dry, draw. How will I draw? Can artificial intelligence help me here? Yes, it can help me here. I go to view and in view, I just go to, uh, maybe I just want to draw somewhere. I will, I'll draw here. So let me open another page here quickly. Uh, this is another page and uh, that's it. This is a new page. Now I click on ink to shape and I take out my, my stylus here. I pick up any pen sh uh, shape here and I start drawing. Let's see how artificial intelligence helps that child to draw better. I can't draw properly because my hands are shivering, but let's see how AI comes into picture. Look at another example. I can't draw properly, but see what happens. Another example. So I, I just need to connect these dots and this is how it helps me. And the final thing, you all know Professor Stephen Hawking. We all know him, but how did Professor Stephen Hawking authored the best seller books that he did? How did he do that? He took advantage of technology and the technology might have been very difficult uh, for a common person to get to access, but now it is part of Windows. It is called eye control inside Windows. If you attach a small device with your Windows device, that is called Toby 4C, that is a device you need to attach to your Windows. And after that, the person who is affected by, for example, uh, ALS, which was, uh, which was uh, Dr. Professor Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, disability issue, the person now just needs to look at the screen of the computer. He's presented with this kind of panel and see what happens. I just look at the icon here, the icon of the windows start screen. If I look at that, that icon, look, the start screen is now visible. If I click, if I, if I just look at the mail icon, then outlook, outlook will open. See how it opens. And I can choose to answer any email like this, just by my eyes, just by looking at the screen, because the power of AI is behind this. So I click on one particular reply button and then this opens. Now this keyboard is there. I'm only looking at the keys on the keyboard and I'm able to type on the screen in Outlook just by using my eyes. I just need to look at one particular key for a second, less than second in fact, and the characters are getting typed here. If I look at any suggestion, the entire suggestion is getting typed here. So that is how people who are affected with the neurodiversity or some other problems, physical problems, they can be productive as well. And last and final uh, point that I want to make, we were talking about people with cognitive disability. Imagine a person who, is, uh, who has this problem, but he has to come out with a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. What will he do? So you just need to go to PowerPoint and click here and write design ideas and see what happens. When I write it, PowerPoint AI comes into picture. It suggests me a lot of design ideas. I just need to click on any of these and see what happens. Uh, if I click on this, the joy of flying. It is automatically made for me, but I'm not satisfied with this design. I just need to click here and see what happens. I'm presented with so many other designs. Again, if I want to modify this text, for example, the joy of flying above, above the mountains, see what happens in the design ideas now. Look, uh, the kind of suggestions it has come up with. 
like this. There are mountains already, and this is the animation. Now let's come to the second picture, the second second page of my slide, the second slide, and there are four different categories here. And again, I'm a person with cognitive disability. How will I create a beautiful, a very well organized PowerPoint presentation? I don't need to do much here. I just click here and say design ideas once again, and see what happens. What PowerPoint's AI does to it? It suggests me a lot of things, including. these beautiful designs like if i click here it is automatically made for me and remember i am a person with cognitive disability i might also be a person with visual disability but i am able to create beautifully formatted powerpoint designs powerpoint slides so that's it from me sorry for the for the time extra time that i have taken uh, i hope uh, uh, i was able to share some uh, good things uh, thank you so much thank you thank you arindu ji um, that was fascinating and i have to tell you uh, i lost a very close friend of mine akshay prakash just last year but he wrote an entire book using toby technology uh, and uh, i was amazed just looking from his eyes he was struck with LA, als and the only part of his body that he could move was his was his eyes and he wrote an entire book and i i can really relate to what you have said uh, fantastic and that's what the power of ai is Uh, to be able to bring uh, solace to uh, anybody uh, who can who really needs it so with that i turn it over to um, uh, the organizers uh, thank you all arvind ji you wanted to say something i i yeah i i just wanted to thank you and uh, balindu for a great job in uh, uh, organizing moderating this whole session thank you thank you thank you arvind ji thank you everybody and uh, i know it's much later than what we had planned but i guess the interest uh, of the session held us all together so thank you all once again have a great afternoon and i hope you all are very safe and continue to be safe and please enjoy the rest of the sessions of race 2020 thank you thank you thank, thank you, you.